I want to thank you all for being here, and I want to welcome you. I want to welcome honorees, my dean colleagues, my faculty colleagues. We have graduate students, alumni, special guests. I want to welcome you all to this uh, awards luncheon, uh, this very special time. I'm Lori Kletzer. I'm vice provost and dean of graduate studies. And this graduate student alumni awards luncheon is belongs to the graduate division and we are it is part of a weekend of activities that we are in, intensely proud of uh, intensely proud of the ways in which this weekend allows us to celebrate our current graduate students which is what we did yesterday at the research symposium uh, and and now this morning and into the early afternoon to celebrate our grad student alums this is the third graduate student alumni awards luncheon and at many colleges and universities, the first time you do something, you can call it a tradition. I've heard students say that, but, it, but, it, but it's a tradition. How can it be a tradition if we've never done it before? Um, but we've done this one now three times, so I think I can legitimately call this one a tradition, and it's certainly something that we want to stick with. Um, in 20, I'd like to give you a little history, though, um, because there's a theme that this history allows, allows me to illustrate. Um, in 2016, uh, my predecessor, Tyrus Miller, who is now Dean of Humanities at UC Irvine, approached university relations for ideas, not with an idea, I think, at this point, but for ideas about how to entice graduate alums back to campus for Alumni Weekend. We all know, many of us in here have advanced degrees, we all know that Every college and university faces the interesting problem of how do you spur and, and you know, keep the flame going, the loyalty flame, for your graduate alums when many of us really feel that way, hopefully, about our undergraduate college or university, but often less so about our graduate college and university. I, I certainly uh, feel that way, even though I'm a very proud Berkeley PhD. I just feel differently about Berkeley than I do about my undergraduate college. And that's fine, right, when you are, except when you're the grad dean, right? <laughs> to be, it's all fine, right? But it's really not fine for me. So, so, what, um, so I've only been grad dean for, for eight months, and um, so what my colleagues tell me, and what I know is true, is that when we tried to get graduate student alums back, some of the first efforts met with kind of a dull, you know, a social mixer with current graduate students. Interesting for the handful of people who attended, but difficult to get it above a handful. Um, we met more success when we moved the Graduate Research Symposium to the Friday of Alumni Weekend. And I had, and many of us in the room were there yesterday, just had a fabulous afternoon in the world of ideas, going from talk to talk and poster to poster. And I want to applaud one of our honorees, Steve Benz, thank you very much, was one of the judges. So thank you very much, Steve, for doing that. Um, but thinking about why we want graduate alums to feel that attachment to us, to the graduate campus, really helped us arrive at the idea for this award. Right? And that is, we, do, we want to be a part of the successes in life that follow from a graduate degree here. And one of the best ways to help us be part of the success is to acknowledge and celebrate that success. There are other ways as well, but I think it's really important to start with an acknowledgement and a celebration of that success. Right? That there is a community that comes from being in graduate school, right? From the intense time in research, in creative scholarship, in practice, in pedagogy, in teaching, in professional development that happens while you're a graduate student on campus. And we can all share that part of the experience. But we know, right, especially as time goes by, how much happens in life and in careers once you leave this campus with a graduate degree. And that's the piece that the graduate division so much wants to partner with graduate alums with in order, one, of course, to celebrate it, but also very much to create a community where our current graduate students 
can learn from the professional successes, sometimes the professional not so successes, right? But the professional development that we can provide to graduate students will explode, I think, in productivity when we can involve graduate alums in that professional development, in that networking, in the many, many ways in which we want our students to have the professional development experiences that will allow them to realize their, their various goals as they leave us with advanced degrees. And this lunch is an important part of that. So while we were here, first and foremost, to celebrate your successes, and to celebrate your achievements, it's very much, and I'm glad there are a, a small number of current graduate students in the room, that's why we're also doing at the end of lunch the career panel, to put careers. Some of you in the room know the next sentence I'm going to utter, and that is, I'm a labor economist, and I think about careers a lot. So I am particularly excited, post-celebration of your achievements, to be able to emcee what will be a short but focused careers panel. Because again, it is those career experiences that we want very much to be able to bring in in a really more structured way to our, to our current graduate students. So it's a very important way for us to use this time of alumni weekend. So I hope for our honorees that you will leave here with that warm glow, that, that piece of the glow that we really want to turn up the flame on, right? You will leave with engraved Annie Glass platters, which I think are actually visible on the tables, and eager to be connected to our current graduate students. So I will, we will celebrate all the pieces of that. I, will, I personally want to thank you, all the honorees, for doing us proud. Thank you for being willing to be here and accept the award and spend time. And thank you in advance for the wisdom that you'll share at our careers panel. Joining me in, in welcoming you is Chancellor Blumenthal. Many of you know Chancellor Blumenthal is retiring at the end of this academic year. He still has several weeks and probably a lot of work to, to get to retirement. There's no early sliding to retirement here for George. In his nearly five decades of service to this university, 13 as chancellor and all of them as a member of the Faculty of Astronomy and Astrophysics, he's always recognized the important position of graduate students. The important position of graduate students in the research community, the important position of graduate students in creating the intellectual life on this campus. And we have increased our graduate numbers under his leadership, and George has been a steady advocate for, for graduate student success. So George, thank you for your years of dedication and service and support of our graduate students, and I hope you will all welcome me as I welcome Chancellor Blumenthal to the podium. Well, I guess I'll just talk loud. So first of all, um, oh. <laughs> oh, thank you, much better. I won't have to talk so loud. So for those of you who uh, count yourselves as proud slug alums, I really want to welcome you back to campus. Um, Alumni Weekend has always been a wonderful and a fluid celebration of our shared slug heritage. And I'm delighted that uh, the Distinguished Graduate Student Alumni Award Luncheon has really been established now as a weekend tradition for uh, our alumni weekend. I also appreciate the uh, career path panel discussion that Lori mentioned that's following this, uh, this program today. I want to thank, to ev thank everyone who's taking part. The network and mentoring opportunities are really wonderful for our students and really do provide them with opportunity. Even equally important is that we reinforce the notion that yes, careers sometimes turn out exactly as you thought they would, as exactly as you planned. Um, that sort of happened to me in the early part of my career, but at other times, our lives and careers head in exciting and unforeseen directions. And that's also happened to me in my life. Uh, and I think that's okay. I think that's also a good thing. There is no one right way. 
I'd like to start today by offering a congratulations to all of this year's honorees. I know you in the audience have heard these names already, but they bear repeating because each of our honorees has really accomplished important things. And they are Steve Benz, Elaine Gann, Les Guliani, Guliasi, uh, Laura Helmuth, and Jason Merchant. To all of you five, I want to say this. Your connection to UC Santa Cruz brings great honor to this university. The fact that you all work in discrete disciplines is a strong reminder that alumni of UC Santa Cruz excel in a wide variety of fields. And you also serve as role models, role models for our current cohort of graduate students, many of whom are here today. So I want to thank you all, and I offer my deepest appreciation on behalf of the campus. This luncheon is important for another reason as well. We should never lose sight of the fact that providing graduate education is a defining aspect of the University of California. It's a key part of our mission. Graduate school is what brought me to UC many years ago. Well, to be honest, many decades ago. Uh, I don't think there's a, enough praise we can heap on the outstanding graduate research taking place across the entire UC system, and in particular, right here at UC Santa Cruz. We have three dozen PhD programs and more than 50 master's programs spread across five academic divisions. We are fast approaching nearly 2,000 graduate students at UC Santa Cruz. And the research being undertaken by our graduate students and their professors fuels the imagination. It yields scientific breakthroughs and advances social justice. And I just got to see a wonderful set of examples of that yesterday at the Graduate Research Symposium. In short, it changes lives. But lastly, I'd like to say a few words about Lori Kletzer, who was up on stage just a few minutes ago. Lori is our graduate dean, and um, she gave a very nice introduction to this program. But I want to remind you that earlier this week, Lori accepted my offer to take the reins as the interim campus provost and executive vice chancellor. Lori has deep roots on our campus. She arrived in 1992 as an assistant professor of economics. She's served as the economics department chair and is chair of the Santa Cruz Division of the Academic Senate. She did leave UCSC for a while to go to Colby College in Maine, where she served as the provost and dean of the faculty at Colby College. But fortunately for us, she returned to Santa Cruz and took up the reins as the dean of graduate studies, a, a, a role in which she has excelled. And when asked to do so, she also served at least temporarily as the Dean of the Arts. So I sometimes think of Lori as our Swiss Army knife, uh, really handy to have around and available, able to do almost everything. I know Lori will be a great resource for our incoming chancellor. And again, before I leave, I wanna congratulate again all of our honorees. Thank you very much. So our food should be on its way. There, there it is. So we are going to eat and talk and hopefully not chew gum all at, all, all at the same time. Um, so be, because we want to squeeze in the career panel, we, we, are, we are going to ask you to eat and listen uh, and a few of us talk all at the same time. So what we're going to do is jump into the program. And we will be presenting our honorees, I think the order is alphabetical by division, um, because that's the equal, that's the fair way to do it, or something like that. To present the honoree from the Division of the Arts, uh, I want to invite up my colleague and next door neighbor, Warren Sack, who is a professor of film and digital media and digital arts and new media, and he will present the award to Elaine Gann. Warren, please come up. Yeah, I, I do want to also tell you that there's another grad event, uh, the Digital Arts and New Media MFA exhibition is happening today, uh, this evening at the Digital Arts Research Center. That's always a fun time. You'll get to see what our students have been working on for the last couple of years. 
Elaine Gann uh, is a double alumna of the Arts Division. She graduated from Danum, the Digital Arts New Media MFA program, in 2011. And then she received her PhD from the Film and Digital Media Department in 2016. Her interdisciplinary doctoral work facilitated a, com a committee composed of professors from the Arts Division, the Humanities Division, and the Social Sciences. Immediately after receiving her PhD, Elaine was the art director and a postdoctoral scholar for Oerhus University Research on the Anthropocene. Following that, she was a Mellon postdoctoral scholar in digital humanities at University of Southern California and a visiting researcher at the Laboratory for Environmental Narrative Strategies at UCLA. Last fall, Elaine moved to New York to start her current position as assistant professor and faculty fellow at the Center for Experimental Humanities at NYU. She is co-editor of an anthology, Arts of Living on a Damaged Planet, Ghosts and Monsters of the Anthropocene, and co-curator of an art and science exhibition, Dump, Multi-Species Making and Unmaking at the Kunsthal of Aarhus, Denmark. Her scholarly work has been published in journals that include Environmental Philosophy and the Journal of Ethnobiology. And she has presented her artistic work in international art venues and been awarded fellowships by the New York Foundation for the Arts, ORA, the Jerome Foundation, and the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council. For her first degree at UCSC, Elaine was an MFA student in Danham, and her thesis project entitled Rice Child Stirrings won the Chancellor's Award at the UCSC Grad Division's Graduate Student Symposium. Rice Child Stirrings was a 50-foot mural installation that mapped different temporalities of rice cultivation of matter, markets, screens, ecologies, economies, and it remained on display uh, throughout the 2011-2012 year on the second floor of the Digital Arts Research Center. Elaine's PhD work was both a logical outgrowth of the MFA, but also an astonishing extension to that work. While her MFA work successfully demonstrated how to produce an artistic work equal to Frederick Jameson's dreams of a cognitive map, her PhD work showed how to write about the multiple scales, institutions, and species these maps comprise. Her field work with various kinds of rice brought her to the Mekong River, a wildlife reserve in Northern California, genetic labs and rice terraces in the Philippines, a seed vault in Norway, and an experimental breeding station in Puerto Rico. Elaine knits together these distant sites with a form of writing she invented for the PhD, a style of writing that is both personal and yet also extremely articulate about the abstract ideas of science, economics, and politics. Her writing spans the microscopic and the macroscopic, encompasses nature and culture, and yet, at all times, keeps her personal voice central. It integrates insights and techniques from the best of science studies, media studies, cultural studies, and cultural anthropology. And every time I and Elaine's other dissertation committee members, including Anna Singh and Karen Barad, met to review her progress over the course of Elaine's doctoral work, we were inspired by the vast and tiny landscapes that she described and conjured and impressed by the ingenuity of her writing and fieldwork. The primary claim of the dissertation is that new forms of agricultural production and reproduction, like industrial farming and genetic engineering, engender new temporalities, and Elaine calls these new temporalities time machines. The dissertation was an investigation into six kinds of rice, six specific geographical areas, and six temporalities central to multi-species life in those areas and beyond. Ifagao rice of the mountains of northwestern Philippines, miracle rice of the Green Revolution in the 1960s, bred in research labs and distributed by extension agencies throughout Southeast Asia, floating rice of the Mekang River, irrigated rice grown in the Central Valley of Northern California, 
rice genomes tied to intellectual property regimes, and U.S. biotechnology industries incorporated in the 1980s, and frozen rice currently being stored in a seed vault in Norway. Elaine is currently developing a book manuscript from the dissertation with the working title of Time Machines, Coordinating Change and Emergence. She is also continuing to work on the speculative design projects that extend the artistic design work of the MFA and the PhD. Her time machine should be of considerable interest for the artists and scholars of digital humanities, environmental humanities, anthropology, design, and media studies. With her increasingly important international profile in art exhibition, curation, and publication, Elaine represents the best of UC Santa Cruz to the world. The Arts Division is extremely proud to select Dr. Elaine Gann for a Distinguished Graduate Student Alumni Award. Thank you so much, Warren. So I, I believe Warren was actually the first person I um, contacted before coming to UCSC as I was trying to figure out whether an artist and city person like me could make it as a graduate student here. So two degrees, um, an MFA and a PhD, and three postgraduate positions later, I'm deeply grateful for, the conver for that first conversation and the many that have followed with Warren especially, who has been my mentor, my friend, my most wise and most ethical guide for more than a decade now. Thank you. So my, my California driver's license, good for 10 years, as most of you know, expired last month. I surrendered it unwillingly to the Department of Motor Vehicles in New York, where I am now. So this award comes with perfect timing. So perhaps it now takes the place of my license as a marker of how special Santa Cruz has become for me. I came to UCSC because of its interdisciplinarity. By mixing the arts, humanities, and sciences, it made me see the world differently and ecologically. It taught me to ask questions that matter, questions about living and dying together more carefully and less violently. Warren was the first of a most generous and extraordinary group of teachers with whom I studied under and that this award now represents for me. Karen Barad in Feminist Studies, Jennifer Gonzalez in History of Art and Visual Cultures, Donna Haraway in the history of consciousness, Ingrid Parker in ecology and evolutionary biology, Jenny Reardon in sociology and the Science and Justice Research Center. From film and digital media, Irene Lustig, Irene Gustafsson, Jonathan Kahana, and Maggie Morse. From anthropology, Nancy Chen, Andrew Matthews, Danilin Rutherford, and Anna Tsing. I see and live the world differently because of their wisdoms and their generosities. My time with UCSC was also filled with some very special places that I hope we fight to keep. I read for my classes at Natural Bridges and the beaches along Highway 1. I thought about papers while walking through Redwoods, through Upper Campus, and the Poganet or while kayaking and paddleboarding around Santa Cruz Wharf and Seabright. I cleared my head by learning how to sail, race, and capsize on dinghy boats with UCSC's incredible sailing classes, by watching the fog while running along West Cliff Drive or, or Wilder Ranch, by finding the elephant seals at Año Nuevo, the sea otters and magical birds of Elkhorn Slough, the whales at Davenport, and of course the kite surfers along Highway 1. I'm now back home in a city teaching at NYU. This spring, I started what I call the Multi-Species World Building Lab at NYU, 
and next spring, a collaborative and experimental art and science lab. These are directly related to my graduate studies at UCSC, as, as Warren just pointed out. So 10 years ago, when I packed my bags for my first semester at UCSC, I couldn't have imagined the places, people, and things or doing what I just read. Importantly, I couldn't imagine all the warmth and love that made them possible. Thank you for these gifts. It's an honor to be part of Santa Cruz. Thank you so much. Elaine, thank you. Let me, let, thank you, thank you. That was, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. Um, we will turn to the Baskin School of Engineering because this starts with B, not E. And I would love to invite to the podium my colleague David Hostler, Distinguished Professor of Biomolecular Engineering and Scientific Director of the Genomics Institute. David. Thank you, thank you all for coming. It's uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Steve Benz. And for those of you whose lives have been touched by cancer, Steve is doing something about it. Uh, and so this is something I think UCSC and we all can be very proud of. I wanna set the scene a little bit. Uh, so the human genome is the composite collection of DNA information that determines uh, how our bodies grow, uh, how our cells work. And a normal human genome uh, takes us from one cell to a full, uh, a full working adult body. Uh, but sometimes uh, in the course of that process, some cells get mutations to their DNA. So they don't have a normal DNA sequence, and those cells can grow into a tumor. So we knew for many years that DNA mutations are what causes cancer. We just weren't able to read them. Of course, the big breakthrough came in 2000 when we sequenced the first human genome at a cost of about $300 million just for the machines and the chemicals and so forth to do this first genome. We had the great honor of posting that genome on the internet on July 7, 2000. Uh, and that was because we provided the computational work to put together all of the pieces. The first step in trying to understand or read this DNA information. We spent the next several years with the international scientific community trying to interpret this amazing script of DNA that had been passed on from parent to offspring for 3.8 billion years on this planet until it reached you and you and everyone in this room somehow. That activity was complemented by the idea that now maybe we can go and look at what mutations are causing cancer. And we didn't know how complicated that would be. But we created, the NIH created a program called the Cancer Genome Atlas which was a very ambitious program to sequence the DNA from 10,000 tumors. For each tumor, you sequence the normal DNA from the person and the abnormal DNA that came from the tumor, compared the two, and you could see what mutations were in the cancer cells. Now, the big project here was to reduce the price, obviously, so there were enormous increases in technology. And in fact, sequencing a genome is a million times cheaper today than it was in the year 2000. Think about that. That's an incredible technological advance. Steve walked into my office in the year 2007, just after this program had been launched and we had been invited to participate in this great endeavor, the Cancer Genome Atlas. And he was ambitious. He wanted a project that would make a difference. And I said, how about this one? And it was an easy sell. So 
Our approach has been computationally intensive, and Steve and I and others guessed that it might be very, very complicated to analyze these DNA sequences, and that there might be many, many different DNA changes, and it might be hard to get at the ones that mattered. He was right. But I also recognized a spark of leadership. Steve was a born leader and generous to a fault in many ways. And he assembled fellow students, in, in most particular Zach Sanborn and Charlie Vasky and many others, and they put together a suite of computational programs that would analyze these new cancer genomes, find out where the mutations are, categorize them, and start the process of understanding how these mutations make cancer happen. That was an enormous effort. Steve has a very uh, uh, beautiful track record of papers and presentations, new ideas and new discoveries, but it became clear to him and his associates that if you wanted to take the next step to actually start to use this information in clinical practice, that we would have to go beyond the academic pursuits. So Steve and his colleagues decided to launch a company. The company's name was 5.3 Genomics. And the project of the company was to take some of the ideas that were developed here at UC Santa Cruz while they worked and implement them as a program that could actually be used in the clinic. So the, the, the then radical idea that when you got cancer, that the doctor would actually look at the DNA mutations in the cancer to help decide what the best therapy for you is. Now, I have been shocked at how hard it has been to convince the medical establishment that that is the right thing to do. Part of it is the cost, but part of it is that we needed to understand what to do with that information, and we're still struggling with that. But Steve and his team at 5.3 built the definitive program, really, to analyze cancer genomes and understand everything about them that might be relevant for therapy. He had no problem finding funding, and soon his company was purchased as part of a larger enterprise that both sequences the genomes and actually uh, provides that analysis to patients. Uh, it's a great new pioneering endeavor. I think in the future we will all have experiences where a loved one has cancer and the DNA will be analyzed to help treat them better. In particular, you may have heard about immunotherapy. This is a very exciting thing because the immune system can recognize abnormal DNA in the cancer. And when it does, the immune system can selectively attack the cancer and potentially cure you. And Steve's company now has a new immuno project. And what the code can do is figure out what is different about the tumor and how they can get the immune system to attack the tumor, which is a fabulous and exciting new idea. And so I think what we're going to see is that the fireworks are just beginning. It's been a long haul, and, and converting an idea, the lesson here is converting idea from an academic exercise into a real-world, high-impact technology is not easy. But Steve has stuck with it, and we're damn proud of him for doing it. So thank you, Steve. Well, thank you, David, so much for that uh, wonderful introduction, and thanks to the Baskin School of Engineering for recognizing me as, as the distinguished alumni. Um, as many of you know and just heard from David, UCSC was a, played a critical role in the assembly and release of the Human Genome Project in the year 2000. When I entered my undergraduate studies in the fall of 2001, my introductory seminar class as a freshman was focused around a book uh, called Genome, which was by a British author, Matt Ridley. He published this book in 23 chapters, which represent the 23 chromosome pairs of our genome, and it described all the new genes that were discovered as a result of sequencing the human genome and the impact on those discovery, uh, of those discoveries on society. 
the publication of that human genome sequence combined with one of my first college courses studying the importance of it uh, really la left a lasting impact on me as a student. So as an undergraduate, I discovered the world of molecular biology. I wrote some of my first programs to analyze genomes of E. coli. And I began to realize the power that computer science would have on biology when the blueprint for what makes us human was freely available as a series of A's, C's, G's, and T's on the internet. UCSC's central role in making that possible identified it as a world leader in genomics. And the opportunity to do my graduate work there was just too great to pass up. So as David mentioned, after, shortly after entering graduate school in 2007, I sat down with him and discussed joining the lab. Um, he had recently started a collaboration with uh, Dr. Laura Esserman, who's a prominent breast cancer surgeon at UCSF, to build a specialized genome browser that would aid cancer researchers in visualizing and analyzing genome data. So with my programming experience and my interest in background in oncology, thanks to my father, I felt as though this project had the opportunity to have a huge impact on our understanding of cancer genomics. Through our development of the UCSC Cancer Browser, the Hausler Lab was awarded a grant as one of only seven data analysis centers for the National Genome Institute's Cancer Genome Atlas Project, and really was the only group awarded for their expertise in data, an data analysis and visualization. So in the following years, as a graduate student, my colleagues and I developed tools that became a critical part of the analysis done on these tumor samples to understand the molecular basis of over 20 different types of cancer. The importance of what we had built and the impact it could have on cancer patients was immediately recognized by Professor Hausler and his colleague, Professor Josh Stewart. With their help and university programs, such as QB3 and the Center for Entrepreneurship, we met with various uh, venture capitalists and other advisors who encouraged us to start a company with our technology and get it in the hands of oncologists and pa cancer patients. So in early 2010, David introduced us to a, a venture capitalist who believed in the vision. Uh, he was willing to fund a spin out from the university and myself and, and my two fellow UCSC graduate students uh, officially launched 5.3 Genomics in 2011. The university and the world-class faculty here played a critical role in the development of that company. Uh, they helped us secure our IP, and they provided connections that we needed in order to secure the funding. We chose to keep the company in Santa Cruz primarily because of the talent that the BME and PBSI departments attract. And to this day, over a third of our hires have come directly out of those programs at UCSC. It provides an amazing talent pool of highly skilled scientists that are needed in order to build a world-class cancer genomics company. So it's safe to say that without UCSC, there would not have been a 5.3 genomics and not a Nantomics. Uh, the, the company just would not exist today. So over the past seven years, we've helped thousands of cancer patients identify the best drugs for their disease. And, and many are still alive today thanks to our analysis. So I'd like to thank uh, David again, Josh, and the university for the support and guidance over the years that, that have really made this possible. Thank you so much. Steve, thank you for that. I, you make us proud. Next, we turn to the humanities, where I would like to invite up my distinguished colleague, Jim McCloskey, who is Professor Emeritus of Linguistics. Jim, please. Thank you, Laurie. Um, Jason Merchant landed here in Santa Cruz in 1993 from Yale by way of a year spent at the University of Tübingen in Germany before he arrived here. Six years later, he submitted a dissertation in 1999, and that dissertation was a sustained and powerful and convincing argument against a set of positions that came from a paper co-authored and published by the three members of his dissertation committee, <laughs> Sandy Chung, Bill Lajisal, and myself. 
And uh, that auspicious beginning uh, marked many of the properties, I think, that have uh, led Jason to have such a distinguished career uh, ever since. Uh, the book that emerged from his dissertation, uh, published by Oxford University Press in 2001, uh, reshaped the entire landscape for the study of ellipsis in linguistic theory, and has defined the research agenda in that subfield of linguistics for the past uh, 20 years or so. And although he's worked in many, many other areas, he's not restricted to work in this area at all, I think it's true to say that it's for his work on ellipsis uh, that uh, Chase is now best known. Ellipsis, in its turn, uh, is a fundamental, pervasive, and mysterious aspect of human language ability. It's the wordless communication of important meanings by way of fragments, and the silences that surround those fragments. It's an incredibly, punishingly hard topic to work on, uh, but Jason's probably contributed more to understanding of that punishingly hard topic than any uh, scholar alive today, in my estimation. Uh, his work changed the way we think about that important phenomenon, and his own research has been a rich source of inspiration and new puzzles, new questions, new arguments for psychologists of language and for philosophers of language who are concerned with the role of language and language ability in human lives and uh, human destinies. Uh, he's a meticulous and tireless observer uh, who is not afraid as he builds his theoretical constructions to follow those observations wherever they may lead him. Uh, down paths that may seem strange or to be uncomfortable or slightly unbelievable, uh, but if that's where you are led by the combination of observation and inference, that's where you go as an intellectual. And that was the path he followed when he realized to his own discomfort, as I seem to remember, <laughs> that he could prove his dissertation advisors wrong in important ways about a contribution they had made. Um, but Jason lives um, in the real world fully as well. I think he, it's fair to say that he took from his time here in Santa Cruz the values that have enlivened our department, a uh, department he was trained in over many decades, especially a commitment to teaching and a sense of its importance and a commitment to the mentoring of individual students uh, at, at all levels, uh, undergraduate, MA, PhD. I was in Chicago a couple of years ago to give a talk, and I happened to be uh, in a, visiting, a visitor's office, and I had the occasion to observe him, even though he was at this point vice provost for academic affairs at the University of Chicago, engaged in a long series of meetings with the graduate students he was uh, still working with at that point. And as I listened, uh, probably I shouldn't have, but I did, uh, to the way he mentored those students, I saw the same meticulousness, the same care, the same supportiveness, the same incredible knowledge ability uh, that he brings to his, uh, his own work. Um, in 2012, he won the University of Chicago's Principal Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching, uh, the Quantrill Award. But like his mentors here, um, he also, I think, has always understood that as researchers and teachers, we have a responsibility to make sure that the administrative structures that shape our professional lives uh, work equitably and fairly and uh, efficiently. Which is why he has been, I think, uh, vice provost of one of the most important universities in the nation, one of the most important universities in the world, the University of Chicago, where he has been since the beginning of his career. Uh, he has been in that role for uh, more than a year now. And in that work, he oversees the uh, process of uh, hiring, retaining, uh, promoting, and tenuring the faculty of the university. I know less, of course, about that work than I know about his academic work, um, but I know from conversations with him that he brings to it the same uh, mix of qualities that makes his research so special, a kind of meticulousness, a kind of care, uh, a sense of fairness, and a sense of deep insight. There's also a world, of course, beyond the university. And with his colleague, the legal historian, Alison Lacroix, um, Jason has been involved in a project which uh, is designed to use the methods of uh, historical semantics uh, to probe questions of importance to legal history and to current legal practice. Their idea is to bring to bear uh, the techniques of historical semantics to the question of what the framers of the important documents that shape the Constitution and other aspects of our legal structures, what the framers of those documents actually meant by the words uh, that they use in the framing of those documents. What is a militia? 
what does well-regulated mean, and so on and so forth. What did it mean when those words were written rather than as we look back on them uh, today? So that's a project that, in their words, meets originalism on its own terms, and a project which says if you're going to do originalist analysis, you better do it the right way with the best tools available today. Uh, this work, I think, will have important implications well beyond the, the narrow realm of linguistic research and uh, university teaching administration. So, uh, for all these reasons, we are, as a department, uh, very eager uh, to call Jason one of our own, very eager to recognize him, and very proud to welcome him back on this uh, auspicious day. So, thank you, Jason, and congratulations. <laughs> Jim told all my stories, so um, I will tell them again in my own words. We did not coordinate. Uh, of course, I am very uh, happy and pleased to come back to Santa Cruz on, for any occasion, but especially um, as your honoree, and uh, I'm very grateful to accept the award of the Graduate Alumni Award. Um, the University of California at Santa Cruz is a remarkable place for many reasons, which I'm happy um, and pleased to help acknowledge and celebrate today. Uh, before I can explain specifically why, in my case, it was so remarkable, I have to give you a little scientific background. <clears throat> in 1967, one of the most brilliant linguists and cognitive scientists ever, John Ross, then at MIT, made what is arguably the most important discovery in 20th century syntax after constituent structure itself, namely the discovery of universal hierarchical and structural locality conditions on syntactic movement, now known as syntactic islands. This discovery ranks with the discovery that the universe is expanding, that gravity affects near and distant objects equally, and of DNA itself. Just two years later, 50 years ago this very month, Ross dropped a bomb on his discovery. He presented a short paper at a regional linguistics conference in Chicago in which he reported on new data showing that ellipsis, the deletion of syntactic structure, could violate those universal locality conditions. This was the equivalent in biology of showing that in some cases DNA alone didn't work to explain heritability, or of finding that sometimes the strength of gravity varied. Although the work that followed in the next 30 years by Noam Chomsky and many others on Ross's original discovery developed precise mathematical models of syntactic locality, these models all had a huge Achilles heel, namely the second discovery of the repair effects of, of ellipsis. So that's the background. Like many problems in science, people dealt with the counter evidence or, of repair effects by a mix of optimism and studied neglect. <laughs> there, was, there was so much exciting cross-linguistic work being done on syntactic locality that one could be forgiven for not worrying about the puzzling exception that repair effects under ellipsis seemed to form. Fast forward to 1995, when three Santa Cruz linguists, Jim McCloskey, Sandy Chung, and Bill Ladusaw, published a field-changing paper that for the first time managed to model how such repair effects could be understood. I was in my second year of the PhD program when this paper came out, and it changed my life. <laughs> I abandoned my plans to study phonology. I, I, uh, the three phonologists sitting here who were all my excellent teachers at the time, I'm, I apologize. <laughs> um, also, the other graduate student was better than me at it, so. And I began working on the interface between syntax and semantics, trying to understand the new model that my three professors had just proposed. The beauty of their proposal was not just that it made sense for one of the biggest problems in syntactic theory, but that it made further predictions. Well, you can imagine what happened next. I decided I wanted to do the research for a dissertation testing these predictions and buffing the shining star of my professor's great achievement. So I got to work collecting data from dozens of languages, working with speakers and communities around the world. I spent two years here and one in the Netherlands collecting data and trying to analyze it. There was only one problem, as Jim pointed out. The major prediction of their model that I had set out to test came out the wrong way. <laughs> of course, when the experiment comes out the opposite of what the theory says, you get to work on a modification of the theory. So that's what I had to do, under the guidance of a dissertation committee consisting of exactly the three people who had proposed the original theory. This might have been a problem at less free-thinking schools like MIT or Harvard, but not at Santa Cruz. It is still with wonderment that I look back on those last two years of grad school and imagine how amazingly generous and helpful my committee was. 
It's a wonderful and too rare pleasure to be able to publicly express one's gratitude to the individuals and institutions that made it possible to do the work that one wants to do and be the person one wants to be. Outside of wedding speeches and eulogies, we have few such occasions. So I'm going to <laughs> abuse your patience and use this one by quoting the acknowledgments that I wrote at the time in my dissertation. I must also thank these three Jim, Sandy, and Bill in particular, for their willingness to generously entertain and then to cheerfully encourage the analysis presented below, which runs counter to their own. Few committees are faced with such a challenge, and none, I am sure, would have handled it with more grace and enthusiasm. I feel honored and privileged to have written this dissertation under their guidance and to have spent five wonderful years learning from them. Grace and enthusiasm, those are the hallmarks of graduate study at Santa Cruz. I believe, in addition to the requisite scholarly excellence that we come to express, uh, to expect. That led, um, in addition uh, to the dissertation, more recently to the pleasure I had of co-editing with two um, former students and one current student a book in honor of Jim McCloskey, which I s sneakily managed to get him to bring. Um, <laughs> This is a, uh, a festrip for his, uh, on a, the occasion of his recent retirement, in which you can read his great effect on many, many students who studied under him and others in the department. Um, I uh, will also take the liberty of reading um, the footnote to my contribution to that article, uh, to this book. It is more than a pleasure and honor to present this small piece in gratitude to Jim, whose personal and professional example has inspired me for the better part of three decades. His brilliant combination of painstaking data collection, insightful formal analysis, and scrupulous scholarship is a model for us all. It is no exaggeration to say that without his guidance in class and out of it, I would not have become a syntactician. He has been more than a model citizen of the field with an unmatched gentility and good-naturedness. So thank you, Jim. But it is not just world-class professors that make an outstanding graduate education what it is. That much is obvious or should be. It is also the other students, both in one's cohort and in the program, who you learn from and with. It is also the unsung and usually unknown administrators <laughs> who help create the conditions and policies that allow a program to thrive. And finally, it is the staff of the university at all levels, from those in the registrar's office to the library to departmental coordinators and administrators, who are the ones that are both crucial to the success and well-being of students and faculty, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the most important one who was here while I was here, uh, for me and for generations of students, Tanya Honig. She was the light of our days, who was always ready to help with goodwill and advice. Now, uh, in my current role as Vice Provost at the University of Chicago, in charge of graduate education, um, I realize all the more how important an excellent staff is, because they're the ones who really make the policies work. Enthusiasm, as I mentioned, we expect that from great professors. But grace, that's something extra. Um, I, Jim knew uh, that I was a first-generation college student and that I lacked the financial resources to continue without additional funding. And in my last year here, he wrote a very moving letter of support that secured for me the Presidential Dissertation Fellowship from the University of California, which allowed me to finish my work here. Um, graduate education, I will end by saying, is more important now than ever. The shifting landscape, not just of higher education, but of our societies, requires that we recognize this. Graduate education is not just important for the training it imparts, but for the fact that the degrees granted by graduate education programs represent the highest degrees that universities confer, and that they represent the intersection, the cutting edge of the discovery of new knowledge with its dissemination, the very reason, raison d'etre, of universities. People with graduate degrees are experts at a time when expertise and evidence itself is under attack in areas from geophysical medicine, economics, social sciences. There is an unwarranted skepticism about climate change, vaccines, the fact that early childhood education works, that rent control doesn't, and many other topics. These are the things that graduate education provides our societies. So as pleased as I am to receive this award and grateful for it, and of the opportunity it's given me to thank the individuals involved in my education, I more than anything want to take this final opportunity to celebrate the system, and this university in particular as an instantiation and a model of that system, the only system humans have created that is solely dedicated to the discovery, preservation, and dissemination of knowledge. 
uh, for this and for the honor of the award that you give me today and for my opportunity to recognize those who made it possible, I say thanks. very difficult act to follow, to come to the microphone. But as you can imagine, you can guess who my new best friend for life is, a fellow grad dean. <laughs> we turn next to the physical and biological sciences. Um, and I want to invite up Erica Hayden, Director of Science Communication Master's Program, who will present the award. And I don't see you often. <laughs> I'm very pleased to introduce Laura Helmuth, who is the Health, Science, and Environment Editor at the Washington Post. Laura started her science writing career here at the UC Santa Cruz Science Communication Program after earning her PhD in Cognitive Neuroscience at Berkeley. After graduating from our program, Laura quickly ascended the ranks of the country's top journalistic outlets, becoming an editor for National Geographic, Slate, Smithsonian, and Science Magazines, and a freelance writer or editor for the New York Times, Nautilus, National Wildlife, and Stanford Medicine, among others. Laura has also worked tirelessly on behalf of science journalists around the country and the world fighting back against attacks on both science and journalism in society. She is a member of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine's Standing Committee on Advancing Science Communication Research and Practice. She serves on the advisory boards of several publications and was president of the National Association of Science Writers from 2016 to 2018, where she championed equity and inclusivity in science writing. Amid all of these commitments, Laura still makes time to return to campus almost every year to guest lecture and mentor students in the science communication program. At The Post, Laura manages a team of a dozen reporters and three editors who cover all fields of research, science funding, health policy, and related subjects. As the leader of this team, Laura is setting the agenda for public discussion and debate on the nation's most critical issues at the intersection of science and society. She has recently edits, edited stories on the first detection of an earthquake on Mars, the first photograph of a black hole, the factors driving the current US measles outbreak, which is the worst in this country in nearly 20 years, the Trump administration's plan to militarize space, and the energy policies of the 2020 Democratic presidential candidates. On a personal note, Laura embodies a compassionate yet fearless style of leadership. She calls every situation exactly like she sees it, but always does so with respect and sincerity. She's also an avid birder and has written about the neuroscience of bird navigation and bird song, among other avian topics. In an essay in Slate, in fact, Laura once defended bird watching against claims that this hobby may seem a little odd to the uninitiated. <laughs> Laura wrote, there are plenty of things about being a birder that might seem embarrassing to an outsider. Birders have their own jargon. They keep odd hours and speak very softly when outdoors. They tuck their pants into their socks so ticks don't crawl up their legs. But, Laura concluded, birders, as anyone, should not let other people's perceptions of their work impede their own enjoyment of it. Laura ended her essay with this advice. In birding, as in life in general, don't let neurosis, self-involvement, and pride inhibit your enthusiasms. I hope that sentiment will inspire those of you who are current students to pursue your own passions with vigor and integrity 
and hopefully to use them to drive a positive impact in the world as Laura has done so effectively. Please thank me in congratulating Laura Helmuth, recipient of the 2019 Distinguished Physical and Biological Sciences Alumni Award. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, thank you to Erica for running this fabulous program and for Rob Erian for running it before she did and John Wilkes, who's not here today, who founded the program in, uh, in 1981. Uh, thank you to Paul. Thank you for physical and biological sciences. Um, and to all of you in the Santa Cruz community, as you know, I want to echo what the previous um, award givers and award receivers have said, which is this is just an incredibly special place. Um, specifically for the science communication program, uh, no place else has a program like this that takes people who have some background in science and research and teaches them how to tell stories about science, not their own necessarily, but how to sort of share the, um, the excitement of discovery, uh, the appreciation of the reality-based world, how to explain evidence, how to explain statistics, how to help people understand how we know what we know about the world. And that's really the mission of the science communication program. Um, it's, a, it's a very special program because of the people involved, um, the people who've run it, who run it now, uh, the students who are attracted to it, and especially to the instructors who come and, uh, and teach. Uh, most of them have day jobs, very demanding day jobs in many cases, and they make the trip over 17 to come and share their expertise uh, with the new crop of students every year. Um, and there's also a lot of generosity in our alumni network. Uh, we tend to look out for each other, we hire each other. Um, I'm an editor, so I end up commissioning stories from a lot of people who've been through the program. Uh, and it's not just sort of like blind loyalty that we're just kind of tribally looking out for each other. Uh, we, we know that this is a very special program and that the people who go through it are trained very well, very thoroughly in the craft of journalism and also in the, in the values of journalism and in the um, kind of ability to see the big picture, to appreciate why we're doing what we're doing in, in science communication and how to do it accurately and ethically. Um, and I think you know, one, of the other people, one of the other things that makes it so special is that it is in this place. As Elaine mentioned, um, you know, just this ecosystem, it's, it's, a, it's, it's great to come back here from somewhere else especially Washington, D.C., and, you know, appreciate the acorn woodpeckers um, and, you know, the turkeys and the mountain lions and everything that's, that's running around campus um, and the ridiculous diversity of, of, of bird life and plant life and marine mammals and everything like that. Um, but it, being in a place like this, I think, really, do, and in a community of people who care about it, does help you appreciate, like, how the world actually works and our place in it. Uh, and especially the people who, who do environmental science, environmental journalism, you know, there's, there's just an advantage to being here. Um, that I think is also the case whether you're studying genetics or linguistics or anything else. Um, kind of see, seeing how the world fits together in this really rich ecosystem, I think, helps everybody think better about the world. Uh, so this, this program, the Science Communication Program, it's been around since 1981. Um, you know, as, you know, as Jim and Jason were saying, you know, you, scholarship changes all the time. Uh, genomics changes all the time. All, all fields of science are growing all the time. I think nothing, though, has changed quite as much as journalism, uh, as mass media. Um, for good and bad, a lot of for bad. Uh, and so the, the, the program has evolved along with it. Uh, it's been very versatile. It's now teaches classes in podcasting, social media, who knows what other you know, platforms we'll be learning around in a couple of years. Um, and so it's, it's been able to adapt as the world has been changing, um, both in terms of the, the ways information is distributed and the ecosystem into which that information is, is, is being introduced. Um, and you know, we have new challenges all the time. Right now, we're all very concerned about misinformation and, in, and false information and sort of the weaponization of this idea that you can't trust anything, you can't trust anybody. Uh, and you know, I work at the Washington Post, so I often wake up in the morning to find out that the leader of the free world has called my organization the enemy of the American people and said that we're fake news. And uh, We face this a lot. We get a lot of bomb threats. Uh, it's, it's kind of a, a stressful time to be in, in like straight journalism and newspaper journalism. Um, 
and so we've been we've been trying to uh, find ways to kind of signal to the world what's what's real and what's true and how we know what we know. And so journalism has been changing a bit and being a little more trying to try to be a little more transparent about how reporting works, about how anonymous sources works, work. Uh, you know how we how we got our information, where our documents came from, how we did the analysis, what data we're using. Uh, in a way that I think draws a lot from, from what scientists have always done. I mean, we kind of have a method section in a lot of our big investigative stories now uh, that's, that's trying to you know, ex explain how we know what we know in a way that we, we didn't before. Um, so, you know, we're, in one of the things that I think everybody at Santa Cruz uh, and in the science communication and in, in physical and biological sciences, you know, we, we have to adapt all the time. We have to be doing new things. We have to learn from experience, have to use best practices, kind of pay attention to what works and what doesn't and, and, and keep adapting and becoming more versatile. And the, the program really teaches that explicitly in terms of science communication um, that basically any story you want to tell, you you have to think about who your audience is and tell it in different ways depending on what audience you're aiming for. Um, whether it's a visual story, I used to work at National Geographic, if, you know, are there pictures of zebras? What story can we tell about the zebras? Or elephants, readers love elephants. Uh, so we, you know, there's, there's kind of visual-based storytelling, video-based storytelling. Right now, voice is, is a, like a very intimate way to get people engaged in a story, especially when there's some human drama involved. And how do you find the human drama and how do you like, do a fair profile that brings out the human but doesn't sort of caricature them? Uh, and these are all skills that are taught you know, in the space of nine months uh, in this program. Or I, I guess, you know, as with the best teaching, uh, we, we learn how to learn those things in the program and, and you know, kind of start out with, with some principles and then learn how to, how to improve those skills as you go along. Uh, so it's a, you know, as I said, it's a very generous group. Um, Santa Cruz is a very generous place. Uh, it's a very free thinking place. Um, I think the science communication program, like a lot of the programs at Santa Cruz, um, helps people be creative and think in innovative ways about how to, to do their craft, how to do their scholarship, and, uh, and how to you know, develop their careers. Uh, there's also a strong tradition of mentorship, and so to anybody, you know, especially early career people who are here today, um, you know, it might seem now that you'll never be able to pay it forward, but you will be able to, and, and that's one of the most rewarding and useful things you can do is uh, to be a mentor to, to future people who are coming through Santa Cruz or, or coming through your field. Um, and you know, one of the reasons to do, there are many reasons to do that, um, just because you know, it's, it's decent and kind and good, um, but also as you do, you sort of create the culture that you want to be a professional in. Um, you can you kind of uh, enforce and pass along the values that your field in my, in my world, science communication, should have. And it's, uh, it's, you, know, you, can, you can do it now, um, even as graduate students, but certainly as you go along, you'll have more and more opportunities and I encourage people to, to look for those opportunities to mentor and to, uh, and to give back to the community. Um, so, you know, I'm an editor, so my job is to get confused easily. Uh, a lot of what I do is I'll, I'll get a draft or I'll get a story idea and I just end up asking a lot of questions to, to try and, you know, make it clear to me. I, I try to kind of channel the most easily confusable potential reader, potential audience for the story. So um, that's like a, that's a really good skill. And, and it seems to work for a lot of things, certainly for teaching, like being confused easily, imagining how your students will be confused, or when you're reading a paper, helping, helping them explain how to explain things is, is a lot of what we do here. Uh, it doesn't sound that sophisticated, but it's, it's like the, my, my, like the secret of my success is getting confused easily. Uh, so if you are confused easily, or if you know, basically embrace your confusion, it's very useful. Um, a couple of practical things. So uh, Erica mentioned I'm on the, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Uh, we've got a new community, a, a new um, a new committee about science communication and the best practices for science communication. And we have a new uh, call for grants out that are partnership awards between practitioners and scholars. So if anything you do has anything at all to do with 
how your work is presented in the world and you want to team up with somebody who's, whose work is adjacent to your own. They're really trying to, we're really trying to uh, encourage more cross-disciplinary partnerships um, and, to, and to sort of help understand how do you get ideas out there in the world, how do they catch on, um, what, are, what are the best ways to, to do what we're doing, and, to and more importantly, to share what we're doing with the rest of the world and help them understand it and use it in, in positive ways. So I encourage you to, to look at those grants from the NASEM. And then also, um, also I want to encourage you to leak to me. Um, if you're ever, <laughs> if you ever see anything wrong in, you know, there are a lot of things wrong in the world. If you ever see any specific things wrong in the world that aren't being covered well in mass media, um, get in touch with journalists. Sometimes, you know, there are many ways to correct wrongs, um, but sometimes the best way is to shine a light on it. So, uh, leak to me, leak to whatever your local publications are. Um, it, you know, Science Nature, they have uh, ways to, to confidentially share information. Pretty much any journalist um, is on a, an app called Signal, so you can, you know, either just contact somebody. If you already have tenure, go ahead and contact them. You know, call them up on the phone, use your work email, you'll be fine. Um, if your career isn't that set, you can you can use this program called Signal. You can use various, uh, you know, document drop systems that are super secure, and you know, we'd go to jail rather than share your name. So, um, you know, if if you see stories that need to be done in the world, let journalists know and help us tell those stories. Thank you. head is exploding with ideas and, uh, and, and love for this place and all sorts of things. And besides, who doesn't like elephants? Yeah. Uh, as a social scientist, I can actually say, and last but not least, the social sciences where I invite up my colleague, Bill Domhoff. Bill, please join me up here. Okay, so it's all yours. Well, it's my great pleasure to introduce Les Gugliossi as a recipient of this high honor from the graduate division. <clears throat> but I may be a little briefer than usual uh, due to a lingering cough. Les graduated from UCLA magna cum laude in 1973, majoring in sociology. He then received an MA in sociology from UC Santa Cruz in 1977. At that point, I knew Les well. I'd served on his PhD orals and agreed to be the chair of his dissertation committee. But the environmental and energy topics that he would gotten interested in and that were really taking off uh, and was going to do his dissertation research on pulled him into the real world of energy policy. He worked at PG&E as a policy analyst from 1981 to 2007. Uh, while working for PG&E, he in effect did applied sociology, published or presented uh, several research and policy papers during those years. He gained further perspective through his participation in two different training programs of several weeks each, one at Harvard School of Urban Planning and Design the other involving a curriculum devised by the business schools at Duke and UNC <coughs> Chapel Hill. So after about 26 years with PG&E, often reporting to the uh, chief financial officer or the CEO, Les left PG&E. Since that time, he has worked for a Fortune 500 energy company. He was a senior uh, level consultant for Booz Allen Hamilton under a contract with the Department of Defense to develop renewable energy projects on military bases. He's currently associated with a private equity firm uh, based in San Francisco, which is dedicating, dedicated to developing infrastructure. That's among many things. He's also president of the Power uh, Association of California, which is a nonprofit educational organization devoted to promoting a greater understanding of energy and environmental issues. And he serves as president of the board of the Multicultural Institute. It's a Bay Area nonprofit that um, is dedicated to assisting immigrants that are in transition from poverty to workforce participation and social integration. So it was about this time that 
Les rekindled an interest in finishing his PhD in sociology. The department welcomed him back with enthusiasm. I once again became the chair of his dissertation committee, and uh, we were joined by Professor Emeritus Paul Lubeck in sociology, who'd also known Les back in the 70s, and had developed an interest of his own in renewable energy for less developed countries. We're also lucky to be joined by another longtime colleague, environmental sociologist Andy Zaz, who is retiring at the end of this year. So from an academic point of view, Les returned to his dissertation project based on a world, wor world record setting 36 or 37 years of field work. <laughs> Not to be surpassed. This time he put his dissertation research within the context of energy regulation in the United States since about the 1880s, with a special focus on energy regulation in California since the 1970s on into the early 2000s. The California aspect of the project, which is the heart and soul, of course, of the dissertation, was based on participant observation, his direct involvement. But he also went to archival records, interviewed other participants in those past events as well. The result can be viewed as a starting point for policymakers who are about to develop plans for California energy policy in yet another moment of growing crisis and uncertainty. Thus, he's once again combined his academic work with applied sociology. And I think his work will receive wide attention in the next year or two or three through presentations, published papers, and a book all of which are gonna serve as a roadmap to the future and provide policy options. So as you can see from this brief summary, he's fully deserving of the honor he is receiving today. Even though he did not do his dissertation and policy work in the usual order uh, that is done by most PhDs. Heartiest congratulations, Les, you are a finisher. Thank you, Bill. Um, actually, I, I hadn't really thought about my career as uh, an extended uh, set of field work, but I guess that's one way to look at it. Um, and actually, it's interesting that you use the word finisher because, frankly, I sort of just feel like I'm just beginning. Um, but first, I want to say a, a word or two about Bill Domhoff. For, for those of you who don't know him, um, Bill is an exceptional teacher and scholar. He's actually uh, highly recognized internationally for two disparate fields. Uh, he's an expert in the field of dream research in social psychology, which is really his early initial career. But he's also a leading expert in power structure research in political science and political sociology. So he has made a mark in two very different fields in his long career, and it's an achievement that really only only few um, ever reach. So thank you, Bill. Um, you've been a wonderful teacher, mentor, and friend. Um, and I want to thank you for your support. We were asked to speak a little bit about um, what attracted us to UCSC and about our experience as graduate students. Well, as you heard from Bill, my journey um, is, is a rather unusual one. I came to UCSC in the mid-1970s, I first entered the History of Consciousness program. Um, I had gone to UCLA as an undergraduate where I had to learn quickly how to turn a large institution into a small school. And one of the things that attracted me to UCSC was its intimate size. At that time, I believe there were only about 6,000 undergraduates, maybe 500 graduate students. Um, and I frankly didn't never, never thought I'd end up at, a, at, at UCSC. I sort of came here kind of by fiat. Um, I was actually headed to graduate school at Berkeley, um, but one of the things that attracted me to the history of consciousness was its interdisciplinary nature. And I thought this would be a good time in my life to break away from kind of the straight and narrow path uh, in sociology and expose myself to new ideas and 
uh, foster some kind of intellectual development in an interdisciplinary context. Now, HISCON is designed as an interdisciplinary program, but the very uh, nature or the structure of UCSC with, at least at that time, especially with its uh, college system, fostered um, inter interdisciplinary teaching, research, and learning. And it was, that was an, another motivating factor for me to come to UCSC. But around that time, um, I met uh, Wally Goldfrank, um, who um, encouraged me to come to UCSC because the sociology department had planned to open a, grand, a brand new graduate program in theoretical and applied sociology a year later. So I turned down Berkeley, came to Santa Cruz, spent a year in HISCON. I really didn't fit in HISCON very well. There was a very strong political theory uh, component, but I didn't really belong there. Um, there were a lot of other very weird things uh, that people were studying. I really didn't fit, but I thought that, okay, I'll come here and I'll give it a shot, and if the, uh, the sociology program is launched, I could transfer in. And that was sort of the, um, the, the, sort of the carrot that Wally Goldfrank and other faculty members hung out for me. Well, unfortunately, the program did not get approved. So after spending my first year in HISCON, I, I didn't quite know what to do, so I actually transferred to Berkeley, and I thought I'm gonna hedge my bets. And if the program does not get approved by the administration the following year, I'll just stay at Berkeley. Well, fortunately, the program did get approved, and I decided to transfer back in. So one of the, another thing that really attracted me to the campus was his youthful vigor. Um, you know, the, the campus was still relatively new, um, I, and there were, I guess at the time, they were, the program, the university was growing, and they had to hire a lot of faculty members. So I found there was just a, a, a great amount of enthusiasm and with a lot of young faculty members as well as the more senior faculty members. Bob Alford, um, a Californian, uh, was um, uh, recruited to return to California from the University of Wisconsin, where he had uh, been a professor, and he was the, the, the one who started the graduate program in theoretical and applied sociology. And Bob's influence on me um, was very strong, and in fact, um, my, my dissertation um, relied heavily on uh, some path-breaking work that Bob did back in the 1970s. He was awarded uh, the best book of the year in uh, public policy from the American Political Science Association for research he did on healthcare policy. So I basically took the, the paradigm that he developed and the approach he developed to study healthcare policy and carried that forward to studying energy policy. So the germs of the dissertation that took, you know, well, it didn't take me long to write it. The germs of the ideas stayed in my head for those many years, and um, it was only, um, uh, I guess, in late 2017 that I decided, okay, this is a time in my life where if I don't sit down and write this thing, I'll never do it. So my intention really was to write a book. The dissertation was a byproduct. It was something that I decided I'd, I'd, I'd do kind of to check off a box and I guess to be a finisher. But frankly, I decided to just to put pen to paper um, in order to write a book about California energy policy. So when I actually wrote the, the draft, I told Bill, I'm writing a book. But what I'd like to do is um, get reinstated and turn in the, the manuscript to be awarded the PhD to kind of finish things off and check off the box. Well, it took the sociology department, you know, several months to kind of go through the bureaucracy, um, which was a simple process, but it just took a long time to do it. It took months, not a long time, but it took a few months. But during that time, I, I submitted the manuscript to Bill, and he said, no, 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 no. This, is a, this is, looks like a book. It doesn't look like a dissertation. Well, fortunately, I had everything there to kind of revise things a little bit to make it look like a dissertation. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, the rest is history. Now that manuscript is, is under consideration by the University of California Press, and it was Andy Zaz who um, has served as an editor uh, for UC Press for several years, recommended that uh, he thought the book or the dissertation, the manuscript was book worthy and uh, led me to um, an editor at UC Press and we'll see what happens. 
If they publish it, fine. If they don't, that's okay, too. There are other outlets, but I'll have to see what they want me to do with it and how much energy I have if they want me to revise it. But, not, but the dissertation is not only a historical document, but actually it identifies some of the key issues that California is facing as we move forward um, to try to realize California's um, ambition to be a world leader, to decarbonize the world, the economy, and to advance renewable energy policy. So I've had an interesting and rich career, but the things that attracted me to UCSC, it's youthful vigor, um, it's interdisciplinary focus, and it's intimate size were things that, that kept me here. Um, I could have stayed at Berkeley, but those are the things that initially attracted me to the campus, and actually those are the things that allowed me to stay or made me stay. And frankly, those are the things that have given me a, um, a core set of values that I've applied in my career. Um, as Bill mentioned, I've been actively engaged in these uh, energy policy debates for many years, but um, I've been a leader um, as a senior uh, uh, executive at first at Pacific Gas and Electric Company, then other places. Um, I've used the, the, the skills that I've developed here, but more importantly, the values that I obtained from my time here. And I've applied those, those values um, in leadership positions, hoping that it would help others um, you know, see how the world could be different if people are treated um, properly. I really can't say that I've really done anything um, as remarkable as some of my colleagues here um, uh, to you know, receive this award. I, I am deeply grateful and honored to um, be recognized by the campus. And I want to especially thank the Graduate Division and the Social Science Division for um, nominating me for this award. Um, you know, at this stage of my career, I, just, I decided that this is the time to give, some, to give back. And I decided when I returned to Santa Cruz last year to work with faculty to try to re-engage with the department um, I decided this would be a time to give something back. I hadn't really thought about teaching, but a few people on campus have said, why don't you teach? Why don't you uh, give, give you know, back in that way? Um, and I'm hoping that there will be some opportunities to allow me to, to teach and to spend more time with students on the campus. Um, there have been several people, you, you know who you are, who have welcomed me with open arms, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity that uh, you've given me and welcomed me back to Santa Cruz. Um, I'm already mentoring. A, I'm a graduate student in, in politics who's working on a dissertation in an area that I know quite a lot about. I'm hoping to become involved in some research projects here. I'm, I'm also hoping that um, there might be some opportunities for me to teach. Um, I also want to congratulate the four other recipients. You guys have done amazing things and your work has really had an impact and it's changing the world. Um, and with that, I want to again thank everybody here at UCSC, and I appreciate the honor that you bestowed upon me. Well, thank you all. Um, there's much I could say, but I will um, summarize it. I don't think I could be prouder than I am at this moment to be a member of this community and the sense of accomplishment and generosity and, um, and love for this place is, is really overwhelming and overwhelming in a wonderful way. And I would just like to reintroduce myself as the grad dean who signed Les Guliasi's dissertation page. <laughs> You don't get to often say that at a distinguished graduate student alumni luncheon when you've only been grad dean for eight months. And also to set the record straight that it may have taken a while less for you, the paperwork to flow, but it was not the graduate division. Okay? It was not the graduate division. I said, well, of course we're going to readmit him. Anyway, we have reached the end of this part of the program, and I want to congratulate our honorees and thank you all again for being here. What I would like to do next is we would like to transition to the career panel part, the short, short career panel part of the program. We'll set up the stage for that to make it a, a little better to do that. In the meantime, I'd like the honorees to come up, please.
please. You could bring your Annie Glass if you'd like. We're going to do a photo. We'll rearrange the stage. And um, for everyone else in the room, just give us a few minutes to take photographs and rearrange the stage, and we'll come back together. So thank you. <laughs>